Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to today's webinar on 2020 machine learning trends. Uh, my name is Lynn, and I have our three presenters here with me today. Um, very excited to welcome the three from the AI Labs team at DataIQ, and I will let them introduce themselves before we get started. Hello, I'm Amy Coelho. I'm a research scientist at the lab here at DataIQ. Hello, I'm Alexandre Abraham, and I'm a research scientist also at the lab at DataIQ. And hi, uh, I'm Leo, and I'm also a research scientist uh, at DataIQ. So I guess that makes the the three uh, of us. Um, so I think we we wanted to 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 touch base on, on a few topics with you today. Um, so this is us, and uh, the goal of the lab that we have at DataIQ is to try to contribute to some of the academic machine learning topics and the community, and try to see how we can make that useful for uh, the enterprise. Some of the topics we want to talk about today, the first one is maybe we'll see that the hype and the trend, at least according to the newspaper and most article that is being published, it's on always getting bigger data sets, larger model, bigger architecture all the time. It looks like a lot of fun, but unfortunately for most of us that don't have the limitless resources of Google and Facebook, this is not possible. So we're not going to talk about more data and bigger model, but we still hope that we can have lots of fun because uh, we believe that you can learn a lot with less data and also with smaller models. Uh, so how can we do machine learning on a budget? It's kind of a recurring theme that we want to develop and that we think is a great trend to be looking out for in 2020. Without further ado, uh, I will uh, let Alexon talk to you about learning with less data. Uh, thanks, Leo, for the introduction. So why are we talking about uh, less data? It may seem a bit odd since with uh, all the rise of deep learning and big data, we are talking about uh, gathering more and more data. Uh, well, I'm talking about this because we I will speak about the context of human-in-the-loop machine learning. So in the past years, we've seen actually that uh, machine learning has made the uh, has been removing humans from the design and learning processes in uh, machine learning models. Uh, back in the days, we were, I mean, the expert system days, we had very small data sets, and we were trying to get as much knowledge as possible from the human. And uh, then we had more data, and with new machine learning techniques, uh, humans have been um, crafting regularizations and doing more feature engineering to extract the semantic knowledge from the features to feed the model with proper data. And uh, nowadays, with all this massive data gathering initiative and deep learning, we don't have that situation anymore. Even on small data sets, we can use uh, transfer learning in order to pre-process the data. And in the end, the human is barely needed. And because data is the new gold, a lot of companies have been gathering data, sometimes endlessly. And uh, now they want to make sense out of it. And that's where the human is still needed. It's to make sense of the data. And that is going to be what we believe a trend in 2020. So the first subject I'm going to talk about is active learning. Um, so let's say we have gathered some data without any specific purpose. What can we do out of it? Uh, if we are aiming at solving a business need, well, we may need to have a human intervention to label the data manually in order to train the machine learning models. And that's something that uh, Amazon has made uh, easier thanks to Mechanical Turk. So it's e now easy to outsource labeling and uh, it works for simple tasks. Uh, the problem that we have encountered is that for tasks that require an expert, or if we want to ensure the quality of the labels, a uh, lot of companies may rely on experts uh, that they will hire uh, locally, so in the company, and they don't do not want to outsource. Also, it may sometimes be prohibitive to uh, to label a big data set. So the principle of active learning is to make the most out of uh, human labelers. Uh, so if we have the the intuition is uh, simple to illustrate through an example. So let's take the MNIST uh, handwritten digit recognition date task. So the goal is that we have uh, grayscale images and we want to recognize the digit that is uh, written on it. Uh, so how do we do that naively? We just select random samples. We ask a human labeler 
to tell us which digit it is. And the model learned on this data set will have, will see its uh, accuracy increase with the number of labeled samples. So that's the curve you can see on the right. The gray one is just what you could obtain by sampling randomly. But is that the best strategy that we can do? Actually, it's not. Uh, because what could happen with random sampling is that you may end up labeling the, for example, seven, uh, any digit, uh, all, a lot of images that look the same. And what we would like to do is actually focus on tricky cases. For example, uh, the, the samples where the sevens look like ones or the nines look like fours. So that's the point of active learning. What's happened with active learning is that the model is trained on the data that is already labeled, and then we get some insight from the model to see which samples are the most difficult to classify for him, and we ask humans to label these samples. And by focusing on, this, uh, on these tricky samples, what we obtain is what we can see on the right, the blue curve, so the accuracy is rising faster than with random sampling. In the end, on the far right, obviously, if you label all your data sets, Random sampling and active learning uh, ends up with the same uh, with the same score, but the point here is that when you are on budget, you can only sample half of the data. For example, active learning is a good way to get uh, the best accuracy. But again, we could ask: Is that the best way to uh, to make uh, to make sense of the human knowledge? Uh, so when we were I talked a bit at the beginning of expert system. So back in the days with expert system, what we wanted to do is asking a human uh, how he is doing a task, what strategy he is using, which pattern he sees in the data in order to do the task manually. And actually, uh, this can be used through a framework of uh, weak supervision. So now what we, are going to, what we are going to ask to the human is not to label each sample independently anymore but to uh, give, uh, to give a, a data labeling function. So basically to spot labels and rules that could help us uh, <coughs> perform our classification task. So I'll take another example, uh, one that is text-based. Let's say that we want to spot the sentiment in a tweet. So we want to say if a tweet is positive or negative, and we give that task to a human. What could happen is that the human will start labeling each sample, each tweet independently. And at some point, he may notice, okay, now I know that most of the tweets that contain the word happy are actually positive. Uh, on the opposite, a tweet containing sad or angry will be negative. And some rules can apply. For example, if I have a not, so a negation in the tweet, and that can reverse the sense uh, of, uh, of the tweet. So Snorkel is one uh, framework that makes sense of that these weak signals. Um, we won't go into the details because it's a bit complicated, but basically the input is just a set of labeling functions, a set of rules. So we can say, okay, if a tweet contains the word happy, it is more likely to be positive. And if it does not contain it, I don't know, I will abstain. And by uh, merging all these rules into a single framework, Snorkel is able to generate probabilistic labels that can then be used with a classical model to perform a discriminative task. So in our case, we may spot some keywords, we may use the length of the tweet, and maybe we can also use the, the author of the tweet because some people tend to be more positive and others more negative. Um, so why is that clever? Uh, it's clever because actually by using uh, very little time from the labeler, we will be able to annotate a lot of data uh, because one simple labeling function can actually give signals about half of the data set. Um, also, we can uh, use, uh, we can compute these signals from different tasks and we, could, we can use heavy computation to generate the labels. Uh, the point is that at inference time, we will still use text-based labels. So in the end, we can have heavy computation on, during the learning, so offline, and we can still be fast at uh, doing the inference online. Uh, Google, for example, has invested a lot in this project, and they have uh, released a, a framework to use that at larger scales uh, that is called Drybo. And we strongly believe that this kind of methods 
uh, can be a trend in the coming year uh, because of all the tasks that we've seen, all the uh, automated cards that need uh, label data. Uh, so that's why we wanted to talk about it. Uh, we have shown that uh, learning on small data is possible using either a manual labeling or, uh, for example, transfer learning. Uh, the problem is that uh, with deep learning, we have more and more big models, uh, such as a deep, deep neural network, and they are not fit to operate on smartphones or small devices like Internet of Things. So now I'll let Amy tell you about how to make models uh, smaller and how it can be a trendy subject. Thanks, Alex. So I realize that this trend might also seem counterintuitive. In the past year, we've seen some huge language models making headlines, and the trend definitely seems to be towards ever larger data sets and models, and the performance has been outstanding. GPT-2 from OpenAI, for example, used a data set of internet articles of 40 gigs and a model with 1.5 billion parameters, and we were all wowed by the story it generated about the unicorns in the Andes. So these enormous models have a large storage requirement. Just to store the model weights, for example, for the Megatron LM model that we can see here on this chart, takes 33 gigs, and they also require GPUs, and they can be slow at inference time, so it poses a significant barrier to wide deployment. As vision and language models become more powerful, this allows us to create many more exciting applications, such as using object detection for identifying diseases on plants using a smartphone camera, or Google Translate, where you can take an image of some text, say a menu, and then translate it into 87 different languages. There are also strong reasons, therefore, why you would want to be able to deploy your model onto a smaller device, such as a phone. It could be just to decrease the latency time, or it could be to make it available in areas where there may be very little internet, or for privacy reasons. But this obviously comes with very strong restrictions on memory and computational resources. So if you want to leverage one of these models, say BERT, without sacrificing too much accuracy, what can you do? Well, you could compress it. More specifically, you could distill the information that it's learned into a smaller model. And this is exactly what's been done by teams such as Hugging Face, who've managed to distill BERT down to 40% of its size and increase the speed by 60%. But impressively, the accuracy of the model is only decreased by 3%. So how do you distill a model? Well, in 2015, there was a paper by Hinton et al. And they explained that you can think of a model as simply a mapping from an input vector to an output vector. And what you want to do is to train a smaller model, your student, to learn the mapping that the larger network has learned. For each output, the network will produce a probability. In the paper, they explain how the rich information that the model has learned is really in the small differences between the low probabilities for the wrong classes. They, this is their so-called dark knowledge, and it gives you a kind of similarity measure. So for example, if you have a picture of an apple, the probability of it being an orange is going to be very different to that of it being a car. The distillation is not the only technique to reduce the size of your model and increase its speed. There's also pruning and quantization. When we choose a very large architecture, it's because we want to have a model with a sufficiently large capacity for function approximation. These networks are usually over-parameterized. So once we've learned all of the information possible from the large and possibly redundant training set, we can use pruning techniques to remove the least useful weight from the network without reducing the accuracy too significantly, sometimes not at all. This is usually done by removing the smallest weights, and this can be done at an individual weight level or in computer vision architectures, you can do this at the filter level for convolutional layers. And these sparser networks are much more efficient. Another way to reduce the footprint of your model is to use a, a technique called quantization. Typically, when we train neural networks, we're using 32 bits to store each weight and each activation. However, experiments have shown that reducing that down to eight bits with some fine tuning can be very effective with minimal loss in accuracy. This is very powerful because this can bring a storage requirement down by a factor of four. So for knowledge distillation, we're trying to reproduce the accuracy. Sorry. The reason we're excited to see what this field brings in 2020 is that with bigger and better models being released all the time, there are ever more compelling reasons to improve these techniques and to shift the focus onto the efficiency of the final networks. Work's being done to make these techniques more automated and more user-friendly and support's beginning to appear in a number of open source packages. TensorFlow has its model optimization toolkit. Intel AI Labs have open source distiller for PyTorch. And Microsoft's Neural Network Intelligence Package includes some model compression techniques. All of this is helping to make this class of techniques much more accessible. 
So for knowledge distillation, we're trying to reproduce the accuracy of a large model with a smaller one. And now I'd like to talk about reproducibility more generally. So we think that 2020 could be the year when we start to see reproducibility playing a core role in the way we design our workflows, both in research and in industry. So why does reproducibility matter? Well, it can be useful to a single researcher or practitioner who wants to maintain a clear track of their work, have a faster, cleaner research process, so that they can then build on and quickly extend their work, maybe expanding it to run on new data with a minimal amount of effort. It can be useful within the team when you need to onboard new people, or perhaps if a new person wants to pick up a dormant project after the original contributor may have even left the company. It's definitely useful in the wider community when you see a new technique published and you want to implement it and apply it to your own work. Let's face it, who among you has seen something you thought would be useful for your work in a paper and tried to implement it yourself, only to be completely unable to get the same results as you see in the paper? You spend some time on it, testing out different hyperparameters, searching for mistakes in your code before perhaps you reach out to the authors, and how much time has this cost you? Back in 2016, Nature published an article titled 1500 Scientists Lift the Lid on Reproducibility, where they describe what they call the reproducibility crisis in science. In the survey they did, they report that a huge 70% of scientists have tried and failed to reproduce the work of another scientist, with some of the principal reasons given being selective reporting, pressure to publish, and poor statistical analysis. Since then, there's been a lot of discussion in the field of machine learning and AI about what it really means for our work to be reproducible and how as a field we might put in place better processes to encourage reproducibility as standard practice. There's also been a series of workshops at ICML and ICLR and a reproducibility challenge at NeurIPS last year, encouraging people to reproduce other submitted papers and to publish their findings. We appear to be converging on a definition of reproducibility, which acknowledges that there are different levels of reproducibility. For example, for a given paper, you could break that down into three parts. The first is reproducing the method. Is it significantly well documented, including all of the hyperparameters? The data, is it available? And is the split into training and validation well documented? And finally, the experiment itself. Do we know what hardware was used? Which versions of the dependent software packages? One should begin to specify criteria such as these that allows us to begin to quantify how reproducible a study is and therefore to monitor how we're improving as a field. These criteria also serve as guidelines for how to achieve better reproducibility. So one example comes from NeurIPS. You can see it here on the slide. They implemented this checklist that researchers could use to measure how reproducible their work was. One key thing that they encourage is to release the code where possible. No, obviously in some industry labs, there are restrictions on releasing proprietary code. Another key thing is to release and document the data used. Again, here there are some limitations where the data may be private, especially in the health sector. But the key thing that everyone can do is to release very clear documentation on every part of the method and the experiment to enable another team to reproduce their work. That means every design choice, hyperparameter, but also every innovative trick that you had to do to get your model to train. It's not even necessary to release this in the main paper where there may be space concerns but as a supporting document is also very effective. This can significantly reduce the workload for another team to reproduce an experiment, and it enables the whole field to leverage each other's work much more efficiently. The NERPS organizers have also released some statistics from this checklist. And for example, between 2018, when it was first used, and 2019, the percentage of papers that submitted their code rose from 50% to 75%. So we're definitely moving in the right direction. And with these guidelines to follow, we can build them into our workflows, and while it may require a change in the way we work now, it will soon become a habit. And as it becomes an established practice, we all stand to benefit from higher quality, more robust research. For example, errors in methodologies such as incorrect use of statistical tests, which was one of the main reasons cited in the survey by Nature for poor reproducibility, will be much easier to spot and correct. We believe that as a field, being more open and intellectually honest can only improve our progress. In a similar vein, I saw a great initiative launched last year with an accompanying workshop at NeurIPS called Retrospectives. If you haven't seen it yet, check out their website at ML Retrospectives. The concept is simple. While the original paper might not be the place that you want to share all the difficulties you had realizing this work, this is really valuable information. And over time, you may also discover that you could have done things better. The team invites us all to participate in this exercise in intellectual integrity and to go back and publish a retrospective of your work, to talk about it as frankly as you would with a friend if you were helping them to build from it. Here at Dataiku, we love this idea. 
So in the spirit of that, here's Leo with his retrospective on the ten trends for 2019 that he presented last year. Thank you, uh, Amy. So yes, so uh, it was the minimum we could do for our own uh, intellectual integrity. Last year, we, we did the same exercise and we tried to talk about some of the ML trends for 2019. So we thought it would be interesting to go back over what we shared with you last year and see uh, if they stand the test of time. So, well, uh, to be honest, the first uh, thing we talked about last year was about reinforcement learning and specifically reinforcement learning in real life. We did say at the time that it looks like a fourth trend because it has been a fourth trend since 2016 and maybe even before that. And we also had to announce that it still feels the same way in 2020. We had big hope, for instance, that we'd be able to frame some of the classical business uh, use cases such as uh, churn or prevention or recommended system or dynamic pricing naturally in the reinforcement learning framework, but we have seen very little uh, work done uh, that way. Some papers uh, in some contexts, but we still fail to see that implemented across various uh, industries. So that, that's, I think, our first takeaway. We still don't see reinforcement learning as becoming the real new thing we are all hoping uh, it could be. There's another topic we discussed last year, which is that uh, it's easy to get lure into all of those benchmarks and state-of-the-art performances uh, that make the headlines, but there's actually a lot of work on better understanding the theory of deep learning. We discussed last year this thing called the information bottleneck, which was a tech on how do deep learning model work in the inner workings. And this year we wanted to share something else, which is a very interesting body of work that is really hard to fully grasp, which is this phenomenon of deep double descent. So they show that for various architecture, for CNN, for ResNet, for transformers, performance first improves, then it gets worse. And then if you push the game uh, with increasing model size, data size, or training time, it turns out that usually we don't get to see that because this is avoided through proper regularization. But it, it, it is an interesting behavior and it seems to be fairly universal. So that raises the question, maybe there is other way to train a uh, deep learning model. Maybe better understanding that phenomenon could lead to a new strategy uh, for uh, upcoming uh, training strategies. And uh, last but not least, one of our favorite topics to discuss is uh, to share and spread uh, the gospel on causal inference and causality more generally. We talked about those two books and how the book of why, written by the, one of the founding fathers of uh, causal inference, G. April, seems to be a great introduction and reflects on the past uh, work that opened uh, everybody to, I would say, predictive analytics. And we still think that this year, we still see a lot of things going that way beyond uh, uh, predictive analytics towards prescriptive uh, frameworks. There are more and more open source initiatives. So I just quoted two that we found interesting, one from Uber. Uber has had a lot of paper recently on estimation of heterogeneous treatments effect and they open source their Python library, Causal ML. There's two from uh, Microsoft that are worth mentioning. Uh, one is called Do Why, and the other one is Econ ML. This is very much an interesting topic, and it is really at the frontier of machine learning, uh, causal inference, of course, uh, but also econometrics. So it's really it's bringing together people from various backgrounds. And we think that would be a great way to move beyond just predicting things, but to get closer to optimal decision making. So we're still looking very much forward to having more and more things uh, on code inference, especially in concrete business application. So that's it for uh, that retrospective from the past topic. And that's also it for uh, our uh, trends that we wanted to share with you today. And I'm going to give it to Lynn for a quick wrap up. Thanks, all. So yeah, um, just a few housekeeping things before we move on to questions while I give the team some time to look at questions. Um, so first of all, this webinar is being recorded and you will all receive a copy of the recording um, after this is over, so do not worry. There was also a question about the slides and yes, we will put the slides in the attachment section and so that you'll be able to get a copy of the slides as well, so no worries on that as well. Um, if anyone has any other questions for this team of, of brilliant research, research scientists, now is your time. I think we have about four or five minutes left. 
Um, so I'll give you just a few minutes to, to think of your questions, whether it's about applications in your own business or what their thoughts are on a specific technology. Um, I'll give you a few minutes to kind of think about that, and, um, and then we'll, if there are any questions, we, the team can go ahead and answer them. Don't be shy. We still have no question, no questions. That seems crazy, but I'll give you another minute because um, I think there might be some some people typing and thinking. It was clear for, for everyone. Yeah, that, I guess that means that it was crystal clear for everyone, and we'll see next year's retrospective that you were right on every single trend. So I think that's it. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, and again, the slides will be will be sent in the attachment section of Bright Talk, as well as the recording, which you'll receive afterwards. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to listen. Um, I also wanted to just mention that in the attachment section, we do also have a link to the AI Lab website. So if you're curious about what the team's working on, what they're doing, you want to get in touch, you do find that you have questions after and you want to get in touch, I believe that there's a contact form on the website. So um, feel free to, to reach out that way um, and the team, the team can, can, um, can answer your questions that way as well. So thanks again and, um, and I hope you enjoyed it and it was valuable for you and have a great day, evening, uh, wherever, wherever you are. Oh my gosh, we just got a question, last minute question. Um, you want to take this one? Sure. Uh, so the question is what business use cases and corresponding ML models are most compelling? So I think it's a very, very general and broad question. Uh, but uh, usually what we try to, to do when we have helping businesses is to understand where is the most value in applying machine learning model. Surely what we don't want is to have a cumbersome uh, technique or strategy, spending time, resources, and people on something that has very limited scope and value within the enterprise. So actually my first uh, advice would be, don't do machine learning if you don't need to do machine learning. Sometimes it's okay to have a very um, dummy estimator of things or very, uh, you know, very simple rules. So if you can avoid doing machine learning, Coming from the machine learning experts at BetIQ, please do avoid doing machine learning. If you can't avoid machine learning, then uh, there's a great way to do it, and there are some great models and some great use cases. We have a second question. Uh, how average, in average, much time needs a similar project to be completed? So the question is about like how long does it usually take to complete a machine learning project? So uh, it's also a very general uh, question, um, and I think there's no, you know, of course, definite and clear answer. I, I would say that it's also important to to proceed by phases and always start, as I, I would just explained, very, very small, and then try to put that like atomic solution closer to production to get as much feedback as you can before iterating over it and see if uh, you can do additional improvement upon what you've done already. Um, so it really depends. Uh, I think it's always interesting to, like, I, like we say, go with something very easy in the beginning and see if that does it. And if not, then you, you can iterate, but try to make things as small as possible, I guess, is the way to go. I hope that answered that question. Now you have to end the webinar. Thank you, everybody, for joining. If you have any other questions uh, for the team or for everybody else, please feel free to send us a message on the website, uh, and we'd love to talk to you again next year. See you soon. Bye-bye.